Hi, this is Eric with another science quest for you. Today we're interviewing Dr. James Roper. He's a professor of ecology and evolution, which is a branch of zoology, in the postgraduate program in ecology and conservation at the Federal University of Paraná. His research emphasizes population dynamics and conservation. Hello, how are you? Good, good. How are you doing? How are you doing? Um, for the purposes of this interview, we um, try to introduce kids to scientific careers. So the first question I usually ask is, what does a ecologist research? That's a great, great question. And I wish I had learned that when I was young because it took me quite a few years to figure it out. Ecology is um, the study of organisms, but basically it's the study of why organisms are where they are and why they are abundant as they are. So. Abundance can be rare or it can be common. And so either one of those, where we try to understand why animals or plants or bacteria are common or rare, what kind of interactions they have that influence uh, their lives, their reproduction, their survival, why they die, when they die, and so on. And you study ecology in uh, the Brazilian rainforest, right? Oh yeah, so I, I study birds mostly and to study population dynamics with birds you have to find their nests you have to catch the birds and one way we keep track of birds is we put bands on their legs and sort of like this watch here but bands of different colors uh, in different sequences and that way when we see the birds with our binoculars we can read the colors on their legs and know where and when we caught that particular individual I first started doing that in, in the highlands, in the mountains of Arizona. And so I learned how to find birds' nests in upland Arizona. And I was surprised one day, I was leaving my tent. Uh, field biologists often camp where they're doing their research. So I was camping in my tent. I unzipped the tent and there was snow everywhere. Oh. Now we had already found, uh, the, the team I was working with, we had already found birds' nests so now there's snow everywhere. Yes. And when we went out to check our field site, there were holes in the snow where the birds left their nests and came back. So the snow didn't even interrupt the nesting for most of the birds. They, uh. just, they just stayed there. The snow made a little igloo over them and kept on going. That's so in Northern Arizona? That. Northern Arizona? Uh, it's Highland, uh, uh, it's called the Mogollon Rim. It's a uh. high elevation place. It was a lot nicer climate than Phoenix, where I was doing my master's degree. Right, right. Hotter than, hotter than hot. <laughs> there, but my advisor at my master's also uh, was the one that got me interested in the tropics. I went to Panama with him uh, my first year uh, as a grad student because I speak Spanish, and we went to Panama. He had a, a grant, and we went down there to catch birds and, and ban birds and learn basically about birds and so my interest were in the tropics bloomed in that time because I didn't really know anything about the tropics in that way you know in the in the tropical rainforest and life and newbies people that are just getting introduced in the tropics tend to think that everything's dangerous and so my friend the guys I was working with it was new for them too we walked through the woods as afraid to touch anything so we tried to squeeze <laughs> into the branches and the vines and the plants but we had to go check our, our nets that we were using to catch the birds but by the time we finished we, we took naps in the woods laying on the ground we walked everywhere it was fantastic and so then when i i worked in costa rica for a little while and then i came down to brazil and i've been working in tropical forests most of the time ever since I mean, and kids, you should know that tropical forests have a huge diversity of life in them. Uh, you know, it's just uh, one of the major centers on Earth with uh, animal species and different things. Some, most that we don't even know yet, right? A large percent, I would say a large percentage that we haven't quite built. Yet, still I mean, found. We discover new plants and animals all the every time. Year. And of course, with deforestation, it becomes a problem because we haven't discovered a lot of them that are no longer there, right? So right, right. it's another field you can study as well. So. Exactly. Uh, you know, just to, to give you an idea of diversity, uh, here 
you know, I live now in southern Brazil, and it's right at the edge of what's called the subtropics. So it's right near the Tropic of Capricorn. We're actually mm. about 25 degrees south. So um, it gets cold in the winter. We actually have frost, but I'm at a thousand meters above sea level, 300, uh, 3,000 feet above sea level. So you're cold so anyway. <laughs> yeah. But in our yard, which is about two and a half acres, we have uh, seen about 18 species of hummingbirds. Goodness. Yeah. In eastern North America, there's one species. Yes. And, in, yes. and all of them, in, in the United States and Canada, there's about 16. So Amazing. in this area, we've got as many species of hummingbirds as the entire Canada and United States combined. Other species we've counted here, and we've seen uh, nearly, I think, around 150 species of birds right here at our house. Amazing. And that's why you're there, because it's, exactly. it's the place to research, right? Yeah. So what is a normal day for you at work? Uh, what do you usually, like, what do you, yes, that. <laughs> Let me try that again. What is a normal day for you at work? <laughs> well, you know, they're, uh, in a way, that's one of the beauty, uh, the beauties, let's say, of being a, a biologist is, or an ecologist, is that you have a variety of kinds of typical days at work. Some days, you're in the field. And when you're in the field, that's where you're gathering data, you're going after the animals. So typically, if, I'm, if it's during the breeding season and I'm studying the birds, I get up before dawn and get all my equipment together, binoculars. If I'm catching birds, I've got mist nets. I'll talk about them in a little bit. And, uh, you know, whatever notebook I use to take records with and cameras, whatever it is I, I'm carrying with me, I try to keep it light. I head off to the woods and start following birds around. And to follow a bird around, you have to sort of have a place to start. So you've already set up your field site, your study area where you're gonna do your research. So you go there, and if it was the very first day, then you've got to catch birds to put those bands on them so you can see who's who. Yeah. But say you're in the middle of the field, you go out and you think, okay, today I've got to find the new nest of this couple, this pair of birds who just lost their nest yesterday because a squirrel came along and ate the eggs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I go there and start looking for them, listening, hearing noises they make, walk around till I find the birds, I find them, I follow them around. If they're nesting, they're going to do behaviors that show me that they're building a nest. They'll either have material in their mouth, you know, moss or leaves or fibers, and they're going to fly over to where they're building and I'll go find that nest. And then uh, in my study area, I'll have a whole bunch of pairs of birds, each one marked so I know who's who and I know where their nests are because I've been following them around for a while, so I'll go check all their nests. And unfortunately for these poor little birds, they make eggs. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of animals that like to eat eggs. Yeah. In fact, it seems sometimes like there's more animals that eat eggs than there are animals producing eggs. <laughs> Isn't that the way it's not supposed to be? It's supposed to be the opposite of that, right? <laughs> exactly. If you want to reproduce, you've got to have some <laughs> more. Yeah, it's a good. But in Panama, where I was doing my research, where I had more uh, statistics on that kind of thing, the numbers tell us that one in eight nesting attempts was successful. One successful eight. meaning the babies left the nest on their own. Very and low. all the other ones, they were eaten first. Oh my so that's what I'm trying to figure out. How can you have birds that make so many tries, mostly failing, and still have birds? Yeah. But it turns out they've got it figured out. They 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 do stuff to 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 figure out how to do that. So anyway, we're talking about the day. So I'm walking around nest to nest to see which nest had failed. So if I have say 25, 30 pairs of birds and they're all nesting. On any given day, uh, five or six nests were found by a predator and they ate the <laughs> eggs or babies. So I have to go find those and then I got to find their next nesting attempt. They'll try again and I want to find out where that is so I can keep track of what's going on. 
And that, of course, is the way they they do it. They by constantly reproducing, constantly, right? Also, with the out the year, right? Yeah. Exactly. If they can, if and, they can. Uh, uh, and I say if they can because, just like everything else, uh, even in a tropical forest, there's a seasonality. It rains more at certain times of the year than other times of the year. It's hot, a little bit hotter at some times of the year than other. In the tri in Panama, it's hot all year long, but it's hotter at some times. So. Uh, the insects these birds eat, or the fruits these birds eat, also change over time. Right. So what I what I sort of say is, if there's food, if there's food, they're reproducing. Right. Okay. If, the, if their own food starts being less abundant, they'll just quit. Re, they'll just quit trying, and just hang out and eat and eat less because they need to eat more to produce eggs and to feed babies. So they will just eat less, and they do fine. The adults. Yeah can live easily with whatever's there. But to breed, to make babies, you've got to have more food, a lot more food. And the thing with predators is they reproduce much more slowly in general, right? And so. the predators are doing the same thing that the birds are. When there's yeah. food, they're, they're eating. eating. <laughs> and they're trying to reproduce too, exactly. So yeah. just for example, one of, the, one of our predators in the tropics that's really surprising is the little mouse opossum. It's an opossum, okay. like a you know our North American Virginia opossum, only about that big, little uh, tiny body guy. length about that big. But they certainly like to eat eggs because most bird eggs aren't very big either, and baby birds, so they can handle them. But these mouse opossums are different than our opossum, and they don't have a pouch. They've just got sort of folds of skin on their belly where the babies hang on. Oh. A female can have about 10 babies. Hanging on. When they first start, <laughs> they look, they're pink, and they have, you can't even tell that it's an animal. It just looks like a pink seed. <laughs> yeah. But I caught a female once that had 10 hanging on her belly, and she runs around carrying them with her. And I kept her for about three weeks. At the end of three weeks, the babies were all crawling all over her back. They were almost <laughs> as big as she was, but she was still <laughs> taking care of them. So she's producing like 10 babies at a time. Well, they need to eat a lot of eggs to keep themselves. So yeah, and I think we should explain to the kids that eggs are such a target because of the nutrition that they have in them. They're, they're really sure. nutritious, you know? It's like, you know, that's so. That's why we eat them too. Yeah, that's, that is why, <laughs> yeah. Those that eat eggs. Uh, but, um, oh, don't be horrified, everything has to eat. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> The only, the real problem is when, when things impact from the environment, impact the actual reproduction. That's when there's a problem, right? And, uh, you know. For example, so. you were talking about deforestation. Yeah. And we're discovering that with deforestation and people, people often have pets, cats and dogs. That's and those problem. cats and dogs now, because of the deforestation, go into the forest and they eat, they, they actually often don't just eat the birds and they just kill animals them. and the lizards and everything else. They often just kill them for fun and leave them. Yes, and we so have a huge problem with cats in the United States. Exactly. Um, we all love our cats. I'm not saying that's a problem. The problem is that uh, the cats are going out and killing many, many birds. Many. <laughs> and it's a big problem because they're really, you know, reducing the populations of a lot of different species, you know? Exactly, and in fact, in my area, there are a lot of studies that actually address that specific issue. The importance of those animals that follow humans around and how they're preying on birds' nests. For yeah. example, even rats, even the, the wharf rat, you know, the Norway rat that's uh, followed people all over the planet. Yeah. When we deforest, that rat tends to go into the forest a little bit because the, there's houses humans. on one side or people or roads or whatever and then there's the forest and now it's got a way to get in easy and they're also predators on bird nests. Uh, yeah. Rats are big. Rats can eat. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, several species that nest on the ground itself and so they're easy to, relatively easy for the uh, rat to find. Rats are, rats are very successful. If you don't know this, rats are super successful in, in nature. They are going to be around maybe longer than we will be. <laughs> and, um, they have been around longer. <laughs> so. And if you don't know this, dogs and cats, I'm talking to the kids, that sure. if you don't know this, dogs and cats are also not natural creatures. They were actually created by man. So they're still finding their niche in nature, you know? So, so. 
<laughs> so. What, what we all think about, I mean, we all love our dogs and cats and our other animals that we keep as pets, and I think they add something to life. It's an interesting yes. interaction between us and animals. But just like our own kids or whatever, we don't let them run freely in yeah. the environment without us taking care of them. We have, we have a responsibility to our animals to prevent them from causing problems and taking care of them. And so, uh, you know, most biologists that I know have dogs and cats and they love them, but they don't let them run around freely in nature. Well, you know what I have I've seen? Recently, I've seen a collar you can put on a cat that doesn't bother the cat, but it, it emits a high like ultrasonic frequency exactly. like signal that apparently scares birds away. Even, so, a so bell, that, even a bell <laughs> that makes noise. You can put it on a dog or a cat. But well, yeah, so, there's uh, that. I, so I was talking about the, uh, typical day so yeah after I go out in the morning and find whatever I need to find it's it's typically around midday in the tropical forest it's hot at midday and in some places it often starts to rain at about midday and so that's a good time to pack it up and head back to the lab and so uh, also the birds tend to be quiet uh, as the day progresses, once they've all eaten, once they've done their chores for the day, let's say, they, they all get quiet. And they're incubating, sitting on nests, or quietly looking around for food and stuff like that. So it's not very productive to keep trying to follow them around. Sometimes at the end of the day, they get active again so that you can go back to the field. But typically you've got all this information to uh, write down that you've been, you know, you've been writing notes, Every time you find your bird, you write down the color band and everything else. And so you want to put all that into the computer. Because at some point, we have to use the computer to analyze all these data. Right. And that brings me to the other typical days. Um, in a typical day in the uh, rest of the year, or even in, uh, uh, even in the field, You've got to write papers. You've got to produce, you've got to find out what all that information you're gathering is saying, what it's right. telling you, what what's going on with the birds, how many are reproducing, how many are not making it. Uh, you've got to put all that together and write it and publish articles. And so that happens in a lot of the rest of the time. In a typical day, you're writing, analyzing data, making figures, making you know, getting all these details organized so that you can publish scientific papers. And that's how we share that information we gather in the field with people everywhere else in the world. Right. I mean, that's true of all disciplines in science. Exactly. And the other thing is, on other days, <laughs> we teach classes, we have students, we have grad students, we, or, we help them carry out their own research and stuff like that. I was going to ask you that. Do you go with your students to the field? Is that, is that you usually have assistance when you're going out to the field or do you go by yourself? Uh, well, I usually go by myself because uh, one of the things about walking around in the woods and you're trying to find birds is the more people you have with you, the fewer animals you find. Because oh, right. it's noisier, more people talking and you know, whatever happens, more people makes more noise and the animals sort of run away from me a little faster. And so um, it's much more efficient if you go in pairs or in extremely small groups, two or three people at the most. Yeah. But grad students often have to learn. They have to learn how to find nests. They have to learn how to observe birds. And so often you go with them at the beginning to teach them some skills and ideas and stuff like that. But then they have to go off and try to learn also on their own. And these days, it's a, uh, it's, you know, we're more concerned about safety and security and things like that than they were when I was young. Because I spent a lot of time on my own in the middle of nowhere. Nobody had any idea where I was, and I'm walking around that like chasing a <laughs> snake or whatever, you know. And I'm, right. <laughs> but today, Your problem. I, exactly. Today, people keep in touch. Often have well now with cell phones, you can they're better than walkie-talkies everywhere. So you can usually keep in reasonable touch with somebody, or you go in pairs, so that if anything happens, somebody 
knows what you know, mean. somebody left over can can help you out. But basically, that's it. Two people is a good number for field work in, in this kind of situation I'm talking about because they can sort of spread out a little bit. Each of them be quiet, but know where each other is, and they don't scare everything away before they can get a chance to find it. And that's very, I mean, that's very different from other fields. Like in other fields, it's a, it's a benefit to have more people in your group. Like, And my last question would be, what advice would you give a child or kid interested in becoming an ecologist in the future? You know, in my experience, uh, people seem to be interested in nature, in life. We like to watch birds behave, we like to watch lizards run around, we like to watch life in action just about anywhere. And I think as, a, as kids, we really like it. And what happens is, as we grow up, we can't seem to figure out what to do with that. And so we try to find a job that's going to make money instead of continuing what we're doing. Right. But uh, those of us that really enjoy life, nature, and getting out in it, have found that you can, you can do, you can, you can make a living. You can become a researcher. There's a, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, all the national parks in the United States, they have biologists that work there. So you can go into, uh, say, the practical side where you uh, work for a national park or you work in a national forest uh, doing whatever they do. And, you know, you, you, it's not really like the field research I was talking about, but you, you work. The Nature Conservancy has biologists work doing all kinds of conservation work, um, even campgrounds often have guides and, and people that are uh, doing this kind of stuff. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got professors. If you like teaching or you like doing research, which is a blast, it can be a lot of fun because, you know, when you're out walking around through the woods and you see a, a, a mountain lion in Panama, we were driving up a road and all of a sudden a mountain lion crossed the road, or I'm sitting, I'm sitting taking a nap in the woods and all of a sudden I hear a noise and I look up and a family of armadillos comes running by and the, one of the babies bumps into my leg and gets sort of disoriented. <laughs> and or monkeys passing by and, you know, running over in the trees and trying to... Yes, it's true. Sometimes monkeys do try to pee on you when you're underneath. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> so, oh yeah, yeah, it's true. You gotta be, you gotta be sharp. I worked at the no, zoo. Self defense. <laughs> self defense. Exactly. I worked at the zoo when I was younger, so I knew that. And so when I was actually in the in the field in Panama, and there were monkeys everywhere, uh, I'd I'd make sure I didn't stand right under them. But uh, so, uh, it's it's probably true of almost every area of nature if you are sort of interested in it and you read about it and you learn about it it just becomes more and more interesting with each thing you read with each new uh, discovery you make you know i remember when i became a biologist i was about six years old when i lived in atlanta georgia and i was walking in a golf course and i found i caught a snake Huh. Got a snake that, well, at the time I thought it was this big, but I think it was about <laughs> this big. <laughs> I caught the snake, put it in a little paper bag that I had, and I kept it. Went home, and I didn't. I realized I didn't know much about snakes, and so I didn't know what to do with it. I wanted to keep it as a pet, but I thought, what do you do with the snake? What kind of pet does a snake make? It doesn't talk. It doesn't. Doesn't you know, do anything a dog does. So I, I kept it for a little while, and then I thought, I don't know what to do with it. So I turned it loose because I wanted, and I started reading about snakes then. I started reading about snakes and reptiles of all kinds, turtles. As a kid, I was a herpetologist because I didn't have the money to buy binoculars, but I had <laughs> hands and I could turn over rocks, logs, walk up and down creeks and everything, and I could find all kinds of salamanders, lizards, snakes. And so I became interested and started reading about it. And the more I read, the more interesting stuff there was to read. And so just like anything, really, if we're interested in it and we go after it, we read about it and try to learn more, it just becomes more interesting all the time. And it's a, it's a snowball. I recommend that if you're interested in something like, you know, going out and chasing animals through the woods, you just read about it. Read about do what it. other people <laughs> I mean, there's some good authors uh, that have written stuff for people of all ages about their experiences in nature. And they're fun. They're a lot of fun. 
and you can chase them, but just just don't chase any bears. Because <laughs> you have them in New York. <laughs> you have to. That's one of the first things you have to read about. Right, what right. animals you shouldn't chase. <laughs> what animals you should not chase. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I had to learn about Once I knew about snakes, I thought, well, it turns out they're poisonous snakes. And you got to recognize them. You have to know what to avoid. And also, you learn how to react because you know that uh, I can't I can't go crazy because I saw something potentially dangerous. I have to use I have to use my head and think about the best way out of this situation. I've had a few close calls with some uh, venomous snakes, but I just had to use my head and think, okay, what am I going to do now? And <laughs> for me, uh, I've never been bit by a venomous snake. Well, I mean, most animals will, will not attack you if they don't have to. They'll just try to get out of the situation, you know, so. Exactly. It is extremely rare for an animal to uh, attack a person. Right. And when we know what we're, what we're looking for or looking at, we also learn how to react to them. And yes. uh, it's, it's like I, I used to live in Montana, and we had a joke about, uh, what do you do when you see a grizzly bear? And the answer is, you try to look bigger. Good luck. It's the same with the jaguar. I mean, I, I was told I was told that you're supposed to scream and make a scene. Is that is that true, or does that just make them angry? <laughs> well, it, it depends. If, yeah. if you're far away, you don't want to surprise them. Right. But uh, one thing you do, if you have like an umbrella, which in the uh, like. In a lot of areas, you always carry an umbrella with you because when it rains, often you can't do anything, so you just stand there with the umbrella. But you can open an umbrella and it makes you look bigger to most animals. Right. And so that's just uh, one thing. Um, once I was hiking in Glacier National Park in Montana with another bio biologist friend of mine. We we're walking along the trail on the mountainside, and just around the curve on that same trail, there was a, a bear walking in our direction. It was, it was maybe 50 yards away. And I, in my mind's eye, I was quickly thinking black bear or grizzly bear. Yes. Because a black bear is much smaller and black bears are not really all that dangerous. They'll usually take yeah. off running. And while I'm thinking, I was turning to say to my friend, there's a bear and he wasn't there. And I looked, and he was already <laughs> running. Way out in the <laughs> he left you alone. <laughs> exactly. Which my, you know, it's, a, it's that classical joke that he doesn't That's need to run funny. faster than the bear. He just needs to run faster than I can. <laughs> the bear was just the, the, the bear was guy. That guy just left you. <laughs> exactly. Now, now you're going to be injured. But the funny thing was, I thought, oh no, I shouldn't. I need to keep paying attention to the bear. So I turned and looked at the bear and the bear was also running in the other direction. Right, right, into right. The distance. All thought, of a sudden you were alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, funny. Um, That's very funny. Yeah. And, and the, uh, in Venezuela, where I was teaching a field, a field course, field ecology and conservation biology, we rode around at night to look to try to find animals. And we found ocelots, but once we found a mountain lion that was oh. hiding in some bushes fairly close to the truck that we were in. And so I wanted to see if I could get a picture of it. And it, it's like when I got to a certain distance, some part of my brain wouldn't let me get any closer. <laughs> <laughs> and another part of my brain was, oh, just a little closer. I might be able to get a picture. They can be big. They can be, I know in, uh, in Tucson, they're all over the place, you know, so. You know, so. Even if you decide you want to do something else in life to make money, uh, hiking, camping, running around in nature and observing animals is something that anybody can do. Anybody can become good at it, can be a hobby. And every single person I've ever known that does it, loves to do it. And so we get together and go bird watching or we get together and go hiking to look at nature in any way. And really, the world needs more people that are interested in nature. It turns out our world is a biological world. It's, it's alive. It's not alive in the sense that you and I are alive, but it's a living thing where all the life is sort of interconnected in some way. And the more we know about life, 
the better able we are to take care of the earth and to keep us from causing too much damage. Because right now, people are, are the largest impact on the natural world that, that, that there is. And if we can learn how to live with nature, we'll have nature to keep us entertained for the rest of our lives. And, and longer. <laughs> and longer, exactly. The rest of your lives, the rest of... <laughs> Everyone's lives, lives, the whole human race. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Roper. Sure, sure. Thank you, Dr. Roper, for, uh, for talking to us today and letting the kids know what it's like to be in a college with this. Um, kids, um, stay tuned for more Science Quests. At the end of this, you'll see some links if you have for further interest, the different uh, things I find or Dr. Roper will supply for me, hopefully. And um, stay tuned for more Science Quests in the future. If you have any questions, just email me at reference at elwoodlibrary.org or in the chat underneath this video once it's published. Um, thank you very much and have a good day.